we are ready to start. Amen. All right. Good morning to the Sabbath school. Good we morning. praise God for blessing us to be um, in the service once again. Thank God for his holy Sabbath. And we honor him for his goodness unto us. Um, thank you for choosing to be with us in Sabbath school, whether you are in the sanctuary or whether you are on Zoom or Facebook. We thank God that you've chosen to come. And for that, we are thankful unto the Lord. Amen. We thank God for the feast that we have just come out of. And I don't know about you, thanks of God, but I feel the residue um, of the feast. And I am with anticipation. You don't, you don't hear me screaming and howling and you haven't heard me much, but I am waiting on God and believing him that he will honor his word. <laughs> he said, if I would believe and obey, it will come to pass. And so that's what I'm believing him for. So amen. We thank God for another wonderful Sabbath school lesson that the Lord has blessed us with. And I trust and I know and believe that we're going to hear from him again today. So we thank God for our pastor, Apostle James, and to bless Lady Jan. Amen. We thank God for you, Deacon Preston, the teacher. Thank you uh, to the students that have chosen to be a part today. So I'm going to get out the way and turn it over to the hands of our Deacon Preston and our Apostle James. Amen, Sister Tremaine. As always, we, we thank you and we thank God for our uh, teachers of our uh, children and young adult classes. Amen. And and we thank God for their continued faithfulness. I've got to say uh, to, to Deacon Ragland, if I knew he was going to be given a gas card away, I'd have probably tried to join his class uh -huh. to, to, to uh, play Bible trivia myself. So uh, so we thank God for how our, our, our teachers are creative, how they continue to engage our children and young adults. And I would just uh, make this appeal that if you don't have your young adults and or your children on Sabbath school, I would encourage you to just invite them to engage because uh, I will say this, I know what it takes and I know Sister Charmaine's uh, been teaching, Sister Darlene, Deacon Raglan, they put a lot of energy and effort in getting ready, amen, to prepare to teach uh, a Sabbath school lesson. And so we just ask you to encourage people to join uh, because it is really helping our young people. And I think as we think about the title of this lesson today, the war against our children. Uh, it is so important that we spend time teaching our children and what better time for them to learn, to lay solid foundation and engage with us than Sabbath school, amen. So I just wanna say that as we tie that into our lesson today, the war against our children. So we're gonna spend some time today looking at some things going on that happened in the scripture. We'll spend some time in the book of Leviticus and we'll learn about this God, Molech, and, and why God had such uh, hatred. And I'll use that word uh, when the children of Israel decided to engage with this God and what this God actually represented in the scriptures. And then we'll talk about probably one of the saddest events in the scripture, um, a rape of a, of a half-sister. And, and we'll talk about that origin. And we'll tie that all into the war against our children. And then we will finalize the lesson with, how can we as parents, how can we as parents do what we can do to help our children be successful? Because as we look at some scriptures today, uh, we're going to share the Bible's view of children. What was Jesus' view of children? And as we all know, children are extremely important, not only now, but for our future. But before we jump into our Sabbath school lesson, as I always like to do, I would like to invite our Apostle Raglan on so he can welcome you to our Sabbath school class. God bless you, Apostle. Amen. Good morning, Deacon Preston, our Sabbath school teacher. We honor God on this morning and we, all of the saints. We give honor to our Sabbath school superintendent, our sister Charmaine White, and as Deacon Preston has already stated, the teachers of our youth classes, we thank God for you uh, being, in, being so engaged Thank God for those here in the sanctuary and those that are joining us by Zoom and on Facebook Live. So we thank God for all of it. This is, this is uh, part one of a two-part lesson. And I'm telling you, um, our Elder James Taylor, who was our speaker for um, actually on this past Wednesday night, has done a marvelous job of putting this lesson together 
because even though all the scriptures are things that happened <clears throat> uh, over 2,000 years ago, the same type things are happening today. There are, very, there are a lot of cultish behaviors that we don't know about, we're not involved in, but you'd be surprised at what people are doing with children today and how they're offering their children up. So I know Deacon Preston is ready to go with this, so we're going to turn him loose and let him go. Loose the man and let him go. <laughs> Amen, Apostle. We appreciate that. Amen. As we think about what we want to make sure that we take a look at in, in the Word of God. Uh, but we always like to do this with you. We want to first welcome you uh, to the house of God and want you to understand that we're a Christ-centered, Bible-based church that endeavors to teach the truths of God and have a positive impact on our community by demonstrating the love of Jesus Christ. And I commend Apostle Ragland for his focus on the love of Jesus Christ. And in Cobham, one of the things we really like to talk about is how do we really define Amen. God's love? Amen. So we look at it like this. God's love is his holy disposition towards all that he's created that compels him to express unconditional affection and selective correction to provide the highest and best quality of existence both now and forever for the objects of his love. And so we want to continue to thank you for engaging with us. And we've said bring two in 2022. And we encourage you to watch us each week, like us on Facebook, share our information with your family and friends. And as we've said this before, we really want people to engage in studying the scriptures. It's one thing to go to church and hear the preach word. It's another thing to actually sit down read the scripture, engage with the scripture, hear the voice of God in your own personal and private time. So we encourage you to join us, whether it is on Saturday school, evening worship, uh, Monday night Bible study, Friday night Bible study. We really want to spend time in the word of God. And so if you like what you're getting as far as content, share on Facebook with at House of God VA. And again, as you know, we use a three question framework. And that three-question framework is really around what does it say when I study the Word of God? What's the observation? And then what does it mean? What's the interpretation? And then what does it mean to me? So as we look at this lesson today, I would encourage you to get your Sabbath school books. Today's date is April 23rd, and we're going to take a look at this lesson, The War Against Our Children. Our introduction says this. From the fall of Adam, mankind has been engaged in warfare, whether it be physical or spiritual, this warfare has been orchestrated by our adversary, Satan. In this warfare, there has been great emphasis against the will and the plans of God, in essence, to have man walk in the ways of the heathen and their nation. One of the tactics of Satan is to get to humanity while they are young. Throughout the scripture, and even in the days in which we are living, a great deal of energy, resources, and effort have been directed at children, the very ones that God deems as his inheritance, Satan has waged an all-out assault against. Our memory verse is Ephesians 6, 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wicked in high places. Biblical application. The scripture declares that the enemy cometh not but to, for to steal, kill, and to destroy. John 10.10. 10. There is no depth that he won't go in continuing his all-out assault against God's heritage. Oftentimes, he uses outside forces, such as the heathen and their governments and its agendas. But it is, if possible, he will also use believers, which is a common theme in Scripture. Some of the worst atrocities committed against children in ancient times and even today have been at the hands of the believers of Jehovah. The purpose of this lesson is to expose the enemy, his tactics, which in turn will make, make us more aware so that we may be better able to guard and shield our children. So, Apostle, before I jump into the meat of this lesson and going through any scriptures, uh, is there anything you want to share as we look at the, 
the um, introduction of this lesson around the war against our, our children. You know, there is a great war that's going on. <clears throat> Excuse me. Before I say anything else, let me say, in this lesson, there's a lot of scriptures. And you know that time allotted, we'll probably not get through all of them. But as parents, grandparents, even as children, I encourage you to read all of these scriptures. Not just read them, but think about the, the stories around them. But I just want to say that in our society today, one good thing has happened um, because, well, let me say this, the, the warfare of the mind, that's what Satan has attacked our children, is in the mind. Thanks be to God that we look at um, these illnesses a little different to, today than people did 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, people had, you know, they, they categorized people unfairly. You have geniuses or people who have IQs close to being geniuses that, that, that battle with the mind. They, they have these wars going on. And, I'm, and I'm, I'm praying that the church would catch up, that we would catch up and, and be able to identify these things and be able to help these individuals as they go forward. But um, Satan, uh, and, and, that's, and I was saying this in, in my introduction earlier, so much go on in this world there's so many cultish behaviors that people use children, um, they use them sexually, they use them, um, you may not realize this, but yet you see in some of the scriptures, the offering of children for sacrifices still go on in this world. Amen. Those kinds of behaviors are still taking place. And it, you say, well, do they have in the United States? I don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised. Every once in a while, something surfaced where some child uh, has been missing, and they don't, nobody knows where they are, and they never are found. We don't know what happened to these children. So I would say, yes, it may not go on in a, <clears throat> in a large scale in this country, but these behaviors are going on, and we need, to, we need to be mindful of this and keep an eye on our children as they um, get introduced to things. Amen. I appreciate that context and that perspective, Apostle. So as we dig into it, what I want to do is just give some foundational things that I think are extremely important as we look at this lesson today. Uh, and I will say this, uh, having, you know, be, being a parent and one of the greatest joys in my life is actually being a parent. And so I would say this for those that are parents and or grandparents, uh, if you are a new parent, and figuring out this piece, I always say, you know, there's so many things that you deal with as a parent uh, that, you know, when you become a parent, you go into a new phase in your life. And sometimes you're not necessarily equipped to do it. Um, but one of the resources that I've utilized, and, and I wish I would have had this when I was a newer parent, was this thing called Intentional Parenting by Doug Fields. It's a phenomenal resource. So I encourage, whether you're a parent, again, grandparent, uh, if you're a new parent, go online, look this up. Doug Fields and his wife are phenomenal. It's some of the instruction they give, and I just want to read this. He says, every one of us wants to raise good kids who become great, likable, God-fearing adults filled with character and compassion. But parenting is not for the faint of heart. Like every generation of parents, we're challenged to demonstrate and impart our values in an unfamiliar culture. As a result, I see many parents, and I'll say this, grandparents, deferring those parenting lessons to friends, the media, and others. And so one of the things, and we know this, is we're in a cultural and spiritual war for our children's souls, and the battle can sometimes seem overwhelming. So again, as we think about this lesson today, we're going to dig into some scriptures. And I really want us to go, we're going to look at two scriptures first, go to Psalms 127, because I want us to get a biblical view of children first. And then I want us to look at not only the biblical view, but also how did Jesus view children? Because I think that's so important. So go with me to Psalms 127. And we'll take a look at Psalms 127 and beginning at verse 1. And he says this. He said, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain to build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman 
waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. But then he says this, lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that have his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. So the writer of this psalm indicates that children are heritage. And we talked about a little bit yesterday about inheritance. Children are a blessing. And I say this, regardless of how they were brought into the world, children are a blessing, amen, for us. And, and when we think about this, the, the psalmist writes, uh, and the fruit of the womb is a reward as arrows in the hand of a mighty man. So when we think about that, uh, when we think about the purpose of children, when we go back to Adam and Eve and their marriage, the, the word of God says, the Lord commanded them, be fruitful in what? Multiply. And multiply. And then he talked about subdue the earth. So children, every time a child is brought into this world, we are reproducing the image of God. And so the psalmist picks, the, he, he really says, as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. And so we look at that in Psalms 127. And then again, go to Mark chapter 10. And this is a familiar passage of scripture. And a lot of times, I think when Apostle Raglan is, is christening in a child, he refers to this scripture or scripture in Matthew. But, <clears throat> but go to Mark chapter 10, and we'll take a look at verse 13. Mark chapter 10 and 13, beginning at verse 13. Now, if you, if you were reading before he, this, what you would see is there's a question about divorce. There's a question in the context of, you know, what, what, sh what should happen around divorce? And Jesus explained that concept. And then in verse 13, he says this, and they brought young children to him that he should touch them. And watch what the disciples do. The disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And watch in verse 16 what Jesus does. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them, and he blessed them. And so when we look at it, when we look at the biblical view, when we look at Jesus' interaction with children, and a lot of times when you think about this in, in really patriarchal or male-dominated societies, which most of those societies were, um, um, that children were not looked up, they were looked upon uh, sometimes with disdain. They didn't have a lot of voice. And a lot of times uh, they, a, a family would prefer a male child. And Apostle touches on this a lot because they didn't have social security. They didn't have welfare programs. And so a male child would be expected to over time to take care of their mother or their father because the female child would actually be married off. But children were always special. And we see here with Jesus that he took the time in the busyness of his life, he took the time to spend with children. So, Apostle, anything you want to add before we dig into some of the meat of the scriptures in this lesson? You know, Digging Preston, as in reading these scriptures and that you have pointed out, one of the things that we, we must always be mindful of, with children comes a responsibility. Uh -huh. And if they're going to be productive individuals uh, in the church world, and even in society, we have a responsibility to get them there. And you just can't sleep on it. You cannot sleep on it. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that, that how Christ recognized who children, uh, and, and even in Psalm 127, it's a blessing to have children. And now we find in, in Mark chapter 10 again, the Lord is saying, I take special interest in children. And... Um, you know, this thing about our chief apostle, Apostle Clark, that's one of his pet peeves is that if somebody harm a child 
And that's what we need to be. You know, we need to care for our children. Uh, yes, they have issues and attitude problems and all kinds of things, but they're still ours. Amen. Apostle, that is so true. They are still our children. And as we dig into this lesson today, we want to look at some things that have gone on. And uh, I, I see the, the uh, notes in the Zoom. I am, uh, you know, Sister Charmaine has entered a new phase. She's now a grandmother. Amen. And so when we think about those things, whether you're a parent, whether you're a grandparent, our objective really is what can we do to actually model and live a life before our children and or grandchildren that will actually um, direct them to have a life that's pleasing to God. And at the very end of this lesson, I'll share some, you know, what are some of the best practices we can do in uh, as parents and grandparents for our children? So what I want us to look into as we dig into this lesson, I want us to take a look at um, child sacrifice. Mm. And so we look at this and, and I'm going to spend some time in this. So go to Leviticus 18. We want to spend some time and I want to walk through this because it's really important that we understand uh, this God Moloch. And, and as I was studying this lesson, um, God's view on this. So go to Leviticus 18 and I want us to spend some time just looking at and getting an understanding of what was happening here in Leviticus chapter 18. And it begins at verse 1. So Leviticus 18, verse 1. And this is what it says. He says here, he said, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, I am the Lord your God, after the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein ye dwelt, shall ye not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whether I bring you, shall ye not do. Neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. Ye shall do my judgments and keep my ordinances and walk therein. I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. So I want to give you clarity. He's speaking to the children of Israel, and he's saying, you know what? I want you to be mindful. You don't, you, you learn some things in Egypt that I don't want you to carry into the promised land. And then he says, you're going into a land of Canaan. And I don't want you to pick up their ways. He said, this is what I want you to do, Israel. I want you to keep my judgments and my ordinances. I want you to obey me. And if you do them, you shall live. Now jump down to verse 20 in, in Leviticus 18. And if you take the time to read all of Leviticus 18, it's really talking about the law of relationships. He's giving clarity on relationships. And he says several things. He says in verse 20, Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her. Verse 21, And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire of Molech, neither shalt thou profane the name of, of thy God. I am the Lord. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. Neither shall thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down there too. It is confusion. Defile not ye yourselves in any of these things. For in all these the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. And the land is defiled. Therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it. And the land itself vomited out her inhabitants. And so I want us to think about this in Leviticus 18. God paints a picture. And the reason I wanted to highlight that is with this, he is talking about relationships. And he says, when you left Egypt, you picked up some ways in Egypt. You're going into Canaan. You're, you're going to see some things in Canaan. And, and I'm going to wipe those people out because of their practices. And he lists several things there. And one of them is 
this allowing their children to pass through the fire of Moloch, that he puts that in there with some sexual perversions that he lists in the scripture. So, Apostle, any thoughts on that as we think about God's view on this thing called child sacrifice? You know, I was thinking about this earlier, even before he had read this, is that we talk about the children of Israel being influenced in Egypt. He said, you're getting ready to go to another land, and there's some other things that you're going to find there that could be inf that could influence you. And that's what happened in our children today. We rear them at home. You know, they stay at home or some entrusted environment until they're school age. When they're school age, we send them to school, and now they are getting exposed to some things. Some things they bring home and talk about, and some things they never talk about. And they, they, this starts at elementary school, but in middle school and high school, you got, <clears throat> and now you hear me bring this term up a lot today, you got teachers who are cultish. Mm. You got school teachers who are involved in real serious cults. The fact that they are employed by the city or the county does not stop them <clears throat> from working what they work. But they do it in a way that, um, that, this, that the system doesn't really take note of it. But they identify certain children within their classes because they throw it out just to see what kind of responses they get. And as they throw this out, they take note of those children that become curious. And then they have start having little sidebar conversations and little small sessions with them. So they may have one, two, three, or four children out of that class that they are now pulling into their circle. And they start engaging in things while they're in school. And then when they get out of school, there's no more jurisdiction, especially when they turn 18. You know, they do what they want to do. But that's how they pull these children in. And sometimes they are our children. Think about it. Our children many times become rebellious to the things of God. And because they become rebellious to the things of God, they look for other things to engage in. And when they hear somebody that have enticing words start presenting things to them, they go, well, I'm interested. I'm curious. And those teachers know just how to reel them in. And, and that's what happened so much today. And I, I'm glad for this lesson to, um, to identify these things. I hear parents talking about, you know, um, and I'm trying to, to hog the lesson, Deacon, but I've had parents that say to me, they have looked under their children's bed and cleaned them. They find boxes of feathers and, and all these uh, other things that they're using in satanic worship or, or in, in things that right in your house, you don't even know what's going on. Because they know if you find out, you're going to have something to say about it. So let's hide this stuff from you. And we have to be proud for, Lord, if my child is getting involved in something, let me see it. Yeah, Apostle, I love that point. Uh, I love that point that you just brought up. Because I think, and, and I want to touch on this, is what leads to rebellion. And, and again, for those of us who've raised children, and I say this, my wife says this all the time, just because they turn 18 doesn't mean you stop being a parent. You're that's a parent right. forever. Uh, and I, I, that's good wisdom that she always shares. So I think it's important. I want to circle back to this later on, this thing of rebellion, this thing of uh, this, this spirit of rebellion that uh, can come upon our children. Yes. And, and how do we deal with that? I saw Sister Furlow's hand up. And so Sister Furlow, if you're out there, go right ahead. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, you know, I was thinking about this whole process of brainwashing. And, and the truth is that there's a lot of brainwashing that happens at school. But oh, that yeah. is why, as parents, we have to also do some brainwashing. I tell people every day, I wash my granddaughter's brain five days a week because you have to. When she comes home, the first thing I want to know is what did they teach today? What did you learn today? And, and, and Apostle is right. Sometimes they don't tell you everything because it's too much. I mean, she's got a seven-year-old brain. But the fact of the matter is you have to constantly wash their brain, mm. trying to wash out those deposits that have been made throughout the week. And sometimes it's very subliminal and other times it's very direct. Very recently, and I, won't, I don't want to use up the, the 
time as well. But very recently, I have been struck by my granddaughter's school, which is a private school, but not necessarily a Christian school. All of a sudden, they want to introduce this sex health curriculum. She's seven years old for crying out loud. And, and, and what they did was they brought in this expert and the expert was a woman of color. She, she prefaced the meeting by saying, I'm black, which I didn't think had anything to do with anything. But since she was appealing to black parents, it was important for her to let us know that she was black. Conversation went on and she asked about body parts, giving, allowing children to give their body parts the correct anatomical names. Well, that could seem innocent on some level because of course you want your child to be well-versed, et cetera. But there are some body parts that she doesn't necessarily need to know. One of those parts, if, if, if I can say it's not a bad word, but it is a sensitive word, right. was clitoris. And yeah. I said, well, no, I said, I've talked to my granddaughter about her body parts, but I haven't talked about that part. She said, oh, well, hold up. If you haven't told her about it, how will she know how to keep it clean? And I thought, come on now. So, so they tried to, to dress it up and make it appear that your child is going to be limited in their ability to communicate about any sexual victimization they might incur or otherwise, when the reality is, uh, having worked in child welfare for over 24 years, the police aren't asking your children those clinical questions. They're not asking your child whether or not their clitoris was tampered with or not. And so whether your child knows about her, her fallopian tubes or ovaries or clitoris or vulva, those things are not important, but they try to dress it up and convince yes. you that your child is gonna be illiterate in a world that's completely literate about these matters. So I just, this lesson really hits home for me um, because of the fact that I have a great grandchild that I'm trying to raise properly. Um, and right. we do as parents, we have to wash their brains. We got to do the brainwashing at home. You know, yeah. David Preston, uh, as, as, yeah. as uh, the uh, evangelist was talking, I want to say this, as parents and grandparents, the way, this is one technique that you get more information out of your child. Never act shocked. Never act surprised by what they're saying. Because when you act surprised, they think they said something they shouldn't have said. So no matter, you might be, what are you saying? And you, but you can't let it show on your face. And you got to uh, just keep your mouth real quiet and let them keep on talking. Now, if you don't act surprised, they'll keep talking. But when you act surprised, they're going to shut down. They yeah. don't, they you know, they don't go I, too I far. I appreciate <laughs> what Evangelist Furlow said. And I want to touch on that. And, and Prophetess Richardson puts in a good point. She said, anoint your children with oil and pray over them before they leave your home yes. and talk openly with them. This is what I did with my foster children. And I think that that is so important. What the what scientific studies show and what we, we intuitively know is parents have the greatest influence on their children. And That's a right. lot of times while we think they're not listening, while we think they're not watching, they are actually watching a lot of our behaviors. And you will hear me say this and I'll go over it later. Uh, I have a saying that um, Chip Ingram says all the time, more is caught than taught. Um, our children watch us more than we think they do, but they are always watching our behaviors. Right. And again, we may not do everything right, but it, they will model a lot of the behaviors they catch from us. Uh, and so we've got to be very mindful of that. And so I appreciate the feedback and the dialogue. I see Sister Jackie says, you know, we're living in a time where kids are being seduced by witchcraft, plus the rebellion is controlling. And I think that's good. I think the other thing we got to be mindful of, and I say it all the time, this right here, this these devices, man, you talk about something that, we didn't, I didn't have when I was growing up. Apostle didn't have when he was growing up. But this device right here connects them to the whole world, not just Virginia or Illinois or, or somewhere. It connects them to the entire world. Worldwide and they man. can pick up things that we just don't see and know. And so, again, I think that's really important. We've got one more question from uh, Brother Sister or Brother Jones. Go right ahead. Um, I got a question. I got a comment that um, when we have our grandkids over, and I see that this is losing that a lot of families, they're not sitting down at the table with their kids eating dinner with everybody come home, they're grab that place, they go in that room, they disappear and stuff, and 
when we when I know when y'all was growing up and when I was growing up, we sat down at the dinner table and we talked about what happened at school, what was going on, what was our problem, and the, and, and the parents would, 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 would sit there and, and tell us things. And I found out in life that um, children just learn the most from from birth to the age of six. They learn right from wrong. They learn how to do things, and this is what the parents need to teach. Them. But in society today, we got kids are having kids, and they don't know the structure of, of how to take care of the kids, how to talk to the kids. They want to be the kids' friend. And because when I was growing up, I was scared of my parents. <laughs> I was scared of my mother. My mother could look at me and, and just look over there, and, and I'm stopping what I'm doing. I'm still scared. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, still. <laughs> Even though my mother passed away, but I'm still here. But 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 the thing is, is that we are losing human contact with our kids. That's true. We need to start because when 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 the grandkids come over here, me and me and Miss Jones, we, we, we don't let them sit in the in, in, in the living room eat. We sit at the table. I fix the I fix the breakfast. We all sit there. And then we start asking questions. How was your day? How was your school and stuff like that? But we lose them when they go back home to their parents. That's right. Because we, we, we asked them the question, when, when y'all at home, do y'all sit at the table? They said, no, we just get out, play, go down and run, get on the video yeah. games. You know, and, th- and that's what's hurting our kids too, video games. Yeah, oh, yes. And, um, and, and not sitting there and telling them that the basic of, of, of life, because kids they, they don't even know how to wash themselves. They, they don't know how to brush their teeth. Because we are send the grandkids in, in, in the bathroom to take a shower. They would get in the shower and just run the water. And my and, and Miss Jones are, are popping on them. They just stand there with the water running. They ain't putting no soap on them. They, they ain't doing nothing. And she got to get in there and, and show them and, and, and teach them, you know, because they're not learning it at, at home. So my, my, my thing of the whole thing is we got to start teaching the kids at a younger age from birth to six, telling them this is wrong, this is right, this is wrong, because kids are learning that wrong is right and right is wrong. They're yeah. learning the opposite, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Brother Jones, I think that's a great point. And two things I, I want to pull out, and then I'm going to get to Sister Charmaine. Um, family time, especially dinner time, and again, there's studies about that, that that time to bond and connect is so important. So I'm glad you brought that out. And then it's something, as we would think, as simple as a shower, learning how to take a shower, learning how to brush your teeth. Uh, You think a person should know that, but if you've never been taught that, how would you know? So I think this is so important that we teach our children. And remember, you're going to hear me say this, more is caught than taught. So modeling behavior, but also spending time that they get fundamental skills so important. So, Brother Jones, thanks for that. Sister Charmaine, I see you've got your hand up. Yes, I, I wanted to go back to that, that place of, um, I think one of the, someone mentioned witchcraft. Yep. Uh huh. Because <laughs> that, that place with young people is so subtle uh, when that is introduced to them. Uh, and I'll share this real quick. I know we got to move on. Um, oh my God, I got the scar, the t-shirt and the hat on approaching things wrong in the wrong mm-hmm. way. Uh, Cause as a parent, we, we so desperately want our children to know about God, know the things of the Lord. And then there was a place of fear that comes upon me sometimes when I think that my child is not going to go the way of the Lord. And so the wrong way was to tell them about what God said and, and so on and so forth, and it almost choked her out. Choked her out in a way that that's when that witchcraft spirit comes in and says, do you really believe that your God you serve is going to do that to you? And so you got to be real careful, real careful how we introduce God to our children. Because if we're not careful, instead of drawing them to the Lord, we'll run them away. So I, it's so much I can say. So I'm going to table it right there. So that witchcraft spirit, yeah. it's when we hear, we're thinking, oh, they're going to bring in all kinds of different gadgets. No, no, no. It's it's coming against what we know what God says is right. And then they have a very subtle way of introducing a different method. God is against it, but it's a different method 
that's not the way God really feels about it. You got a misinterpretation of the scripture. So I just want to share that. And Sister Charmaine, that was a that was a nugget because it, I think the thing we think about the witchcraft, we see it on two separate sides, but really it's extremely subtle. It is very subtle on how it's introduced and how it is designed to chip away at the God that we serve. So I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, and hopefully we can have some more conversation. I know our time is getting away from us, but again, whenever I see the class engage so much, I know it's a topic that's important. The last thing I'll say is this, is uh, someone put in the chat, just the amount of screen time that our children, and even we've got to be mindful that the screen time and when our children are talking to us, are we present with them? Because it's very easy to get so distracted by our devices that we miss moments with our children. So again, great feedback, great content and sharing. I appreciate that. And, and I, I, Sister Candace says something, and then we'll jump to Leviticus 20. It says, witchcraft is in little kids, movies, books, clothing, jewelry. It gets embedded in their minds and they grow up as it if it is nothing because it has been a part of their childhood. So I'll say this, the enemy is extremely subtle. Oh yes. And so we've got to be very, very mindful as parents and grandparents. Uh, all the enemy needs is a crack and he will come in and do what he, he does and he does it well. So go to Leviticus chapter 20. And I want to just touch on this because um, you hear about this, this God Moloch, and I want to just point this out as we think about child sacrifice and, and what it was and, and why God was so against it. So Leviticus chapter 20, verses 1 through 5, and it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Again, thou shalt say to the children of Israel, Who, Whosoever he be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn in Israel, that giveth any of his seed unto Molech, he shall surely be put to death, and the people of the land shall stone him with stones. And I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people because he hath given of his seed unto Molech to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. And if the people of the land do any ways hide their eyes from the man when he giveth of his seed unto Molech and kill him not, then I will set my face against that man and against his family and will cut him off and all that go a hoing after him to commit whoredom with Molech from among their people. So I want to keep, I want to bring this up because as I was studying this, God really, they, and this was Israel's problem. They always found other gods. They want, they would serve other gods. They got pulled away into idolatry. And Moloch was one of those gods. Uh, it was, it was, he was a God of child sacrifice. And so what would happen as we think about what would happen with Moloch would be um, and, and when you think about Moloch was a Canaanite God, uh, and it was practicing child sacrifice and what would happen, uh, they would create this, really this cauldron or this bowling point and the top of it would have a bull's head. And then they would put the child or, or the, the child on the altar and they would sacrifice the child to this God Moloch. And so what would happen is there would be people around and they would be singing and they would be dancing. And typically a father would take his child and offer this child to the God Moloch. And you see in the scriptures where God speaks so hard against the children of Israel being caught up in offering their children. So what does that mean for us today? When we think about, are we giving our children over to things that displease God? Are we allowing them to be exposed to things that are not like God? And again, we have to we have to model that. We have to be temperate with it, but we also have to be mindful from the standpoint of these things that get into our children's mind. I said it earlier. All Satan needs is a crack, and then he can do 
his work. So, Apostle, any thoughts before we jump to our next scripture? Yes, sir. A, a couple of things here. This is an example of how God had to use extreme behavior to nip this in the bud. Yeah. Because if he, if God had not look, he said what? If they do it, kill them. Mm. If they if they give their child over to this God to mold it, kill them. And if somebody else support that, kill them. In other words, he said, kill it, kill it, kill it, until that thought is out of the mind of Israel. Now, I'm going to show you how, how tricky people would be. People would say, oh, you're reading Leviticus. I'm talking about today now. You're reading Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 20. But what about when God told Abraham to take their son, okay. their only son? What if there was no ram in the bush? Did, did not Isaac take his sword? Uh, I mean, didn't I even take his sword and, and, and pull it back to, and actually was in the process and in the motion of bringing it forward to kill him? People will compare these things and, and make you believe that there is no difference in what God did uh, with Abraham and what these people were doing with this God mold. So we have to be wise in that. We have to be saying that, no, no. God knew that he had a sacrifice. God knew that what he was testing Abraham with was not going to happen. He was not going to allow Abraham to do that. But you got to be careful when people want to bring that to you. There are times when as parents, we do have to use extreme behavior. But at the same time, like Sister Charmaine was saying a moment ago, when we do it, we got to do it in a way that it don't drive them but draw them. So that's a fine line there, that, that we have to be wise enough, and if we're not wise enough, and don't think we are, Lord, show me how to do this. Show me how to bring this behavior under subjection and not destroy my child at the same time. Man, Apostle, that's such a great nugget. I actually, I wrote that down, making sure we don't drive them, but draw them. Yeah. I think that's such a good point. So I would ask you this, is, as, as we think about this component, whether it's a new parent, whether it's it's parenting uh, your children out of the home, or maybe you're a grandparent, what would you say are some of those things to ensure that we draw them and not drive them? What would you, be, would you say are really important for us to be mindful of? We have to be mindful of the child, the child our child, our grandchild, understand the love aspect that's associated with it. Mm. You know, I'm I'm rep I'm pulling you from this. Uh, the example that uh, Evangelist Furlow gave earlier about the school her great granddaughter goes to. Then I'm sure the girl loves going to that school, right? But if things got so bad there that she had to make a, a conscious decision, I got to pull you out of that environment. If you just abruptly pull her out, the girl could become upset, angry, and maybe not react right now but harbor that in her mind. So if she had to pull her out, she got to pull her out, and this child got to understand this is a love act. I love you too much to allow you to sit under that kind of teaching in that environment. We're going to find another school for you, and I know you're going to love it just as much, and you're going to have plenty of friends. Other words, you got to build the foundation so they're going to understand what you're doing and be able to accept it. Yeah, Apostle, I love that. Again, great point. And I see uh, Prophetess Richardson puts in the point on Galatians 3 and 1 in that scripture, O foolish Galatians, who have bewitched you that you shall not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth and crucified among you. So I love that is that, that Satan, his whole desire is actually to bewitch us. So let us think about this as whether new parents uh, I call us tenured parents and some who are grandparents. Let us be mindful of those things as we think about uh, helping our children be the children that God wants them to be. Anything and, you else? Know, yeah, I can press one other thing. We got to, to model in certain behaviors as parents. You got one parent that's saved, the other one that's not. You got to be careful how you conduct yourself with that unsaved spouse. That unsaved spouse is cussing and fussing and doing all this kind of stuff in front of the children. And, and you got to, you know, it's, it makes it difficult, but you got to ask God to give you wisdom and to know how to handle that. 
and know how to deal with that unsaved spouse um, for the safety and the benefit of the child. Just like if, um, uh, sometimes people have sucker marriages or whatever, and even, even actually the, the biological parent of that child, if they find that, that parent is, that is molesting that child, that other parent got to do something about it. You cannot allow that behavior to continue to go on. That's a good point. Um, I, I see we had a comment on Facebook from uh, Brother Sebastian. He talks about, I have one of my grandchildren that was brought up in the church and wants to come to church at eight years of age, um, but they say that the mother won't take them. Uh, I, I would say, an Apostle, you can clean me up on this. Uh, whenever you've got the grandchild, be the example. Continue to be the model. That's right. Um, continue to do as much as you can to influence when you actually have that grandchild with you. Anything yeah. else you want to add about I think you're so right with that one, they can press it. The parent may not take them, but when they're with you, guess what? We're going to church. Yep. And you know what? Most of the parents that do that, they want their time. They want their time to go places and do things. So they may not take them, but you take them. You bring them. Yeah. So I'm going to jump into, we're going to go to our next scripture, and, and Apostle touched on this a little bit. Uh, we're going to go to 2 Samuel chapter 13. And again, we, we knew we wouldn't get to all the scriptures in this lesson today, uh, but I want to spend some time in 2 Samuel chapter 13. And um, again, when we look at this, uh, I want us just to be mindful as we look at this scripture What's going on with this scripture? Uh, give you some backstory. Uh, so if you were to go to 2 Samuel chapter 11, we have this very familiar scripture of David and Bathsheba. And so we see uh, after in chapter 12, Nathan accuses David of sin. And then uh, what happens, we find that from David's sin, turmoil comes to David's house. Mm -hmm. And so one of the first things that happens from after the turmoil, so let's just play this out. David's children are old enough to watch what their father does. They see their father take another man's wife. They see their father, because David's sin actually gets exposed. So they see this this murder, they see this adultery, they see all of this. And then in 2 Samuel chapter 13, and I'm not going to read all of it, but I want to begin at verse 1. And I want to, and I'll jump, then I'll jump down to verse 11. So watch what happens. And it says in verse 1, and it came to pass after this, after what? all the things that happened with David and Bathsheba, that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar, and she was a virgin. And not Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. So we'll stop right there as we watch this. So when we think about the lot, and I'm saying, I'm talking to parents now, the lives we live before our children. So if you look at what happened with David, his children see this, the whole kingdom actually sees it. Mm -hmm. uh, Nathan says, hey, David, you're actually the man. The child that David and Bathsheba had passes away. And then in first, verse 13 or chapter 13, it says, and it came to pass after this, all these things that occurred, and we see David's son Amnon uh, falls in quote unquote love, we would say lust, with his half sister. And then jump down to verse 11. And it says, um, And when she had brought them unto him, he wanted something to eat, he was playing sick, uh, and he, she brought him something to eat. He took hold of her and said unto her, come lie with me, my sister. And she answered him, nay, my brother, do not force me, for no such thing ought to be done in Israel. She said, don't bring this shame upon the land of Israel. Do not bow this folly. 
and I, whether shall I cause my shame to go? And as for thee, thou shalt be as one of the fools in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray thee, speak unto the king, for he will not withhold me from thee. Howbeit he would not hearken unto her voice, but being stronger than she forced her and lay with her. So Amnon rapes his half-sister. And so why is this important? We're protecting our children, whether it's rape, whether it's molestation, whether it's sexual abuse. Well, this scripture is really getting at that, that we've got to be mindful. And again, the scripture says that she would have been a young girl. She was a virgin, and, and, and he did this thing to her. Let's see how it plays out. So after he does this, verse 15, then Amnon hated her exceedingly so that the hatred wherewith he hated her was greater than the love wherewith he had loved her. And not Amnon said unto her, her, arise, be gone. And she said unto him, there is no cause. The evil in sending me away is greater than that thou than the other that thou didst to me, but he would not hearken unto her. Then he called his servant and ministered unto him and said, put now this woman out from me and bolt the door after her. And she had a garment of divers colors upon her for with, for with such robe was the king's daughter that were virgins apparel. Then his servant brought her out and bolted the door after her. And Tamar put ashes on her head and rent her garment of divers colors that was on her and laid her hand on her head and went on crying. And Absalom, her brother, said unto her, Have Amnon thy brother been with thee? But hold now thy peace, my sister. He is thy brother. Regard not this thing. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother's house. But when King David heard of all these things, he was wroth. And Absalom spake unto his brother, Amnon, neither good nor bad. For Absalom hated Amnon because he had forced his sister Tamar. So Apostle, as you look at this scripture and hear this dynamic, as we think about this, as we think about protecting our children, what comes to your mind that we should pull out of this scripture today? What comes to my mind is that this stuff goes on even now. It mm. goes on in families today. And um, if you got a, a child that seemingly um, some, of the, some of that behavior is not appropriate, you got to recognize that thing and call it out. Mm. You got to bring that, you got to bring that to the surface and, and, and make sure that they understand this behavior is not going to be, be tolerated in this house. Don't let it go that far. But, you know, as the story go on, you see what happened with, with um, Absalom and, and, um, and Enoch said right here, he didn't say anything one way or the other, but it didn't leave his mind. And, and you know, people, even though, and I, and, I, and I hear Tamar's plea, this is not acceptable in Israel. You're going to bring shame to you. You're going to bring shame to me. You're going to be like one of the fools. That's right. You know, here, here, a poor girl, she's pleading with her brother saying, you're going to be made to look like a fool, and I'm going to be shamed. And, and, and look at the consequences we're facing. I give her credit for really pouring out the consequences, even though it didn't stop him. And take note of this. After it was over, a one-time thing. After that, he turned. <laughs> yeah. Apostle, that's such a good point. And, and I, I love what Prophetess Richardson says in the comments. She said, you need to talk to your children as early as you can so uh, you will know how to protect them because they might go through something. They are too young to understand what right. is going on in their lives. Pray over them and plead the blood. And I think it gets back to making sure we create an environment as parents that our children aren't afraid to talk to us. They aren't afraid to have conversation. And if something happens, um, that they can come to us and say, hey, this happened. And again, it didn't feel right. It didn't seem right. And we have that conversation. But as we look at this scripture, 
this one time event, this one time thing That's what it was. Um, brought a lot because here's the thing. Absalom waited two years. Yep. And then he killed Amnon. Yeah, he killed him. And so he 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 acted like nothing was a big deal. <laughs> but if you keep reading in the scripture, he had a banquet. He got Amnon drunk. Yep. And he said, you know what? As soon as Amnon gets drunk, kill him. Because yep. he did this thing to, my to sister. his sister. And yep. I want us to be mindful of those things. And, and we've got to be mindful that, man, when our children are exposed or something happens, whether it's it's something like this, whether it's rape, incest, molestation. Again, we may not be experts in helping them navigate through it, but we've got to create an environment where they can come and say, you know what, something happened to me. And, 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 and then we need to be able to help them navigate through that. But this scripture is such a sad scripture because as Apostle said, she really wanted Amnon. Amnon, don't do this. Don't make this mistake. And again, as soon as it happened, he hated her. The, the scripture says the, the hate he had for her greater. was greater than the quote unquote love no. he had for her. Go right ahead, Apostle. No, I was just, I, I knew you were going to just echo in it. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I just think it's so important for us to understand that as we look at this scripture. So I know we're coming close to time. We're going to go to Daniel chapter one. I want to take a look at Daniel chapter one. What does the enemy do? So we talked about child sacrifice. What does that look like in today's world? We've talked about sexual abuse. Um, one of the things that, that happens. And then as we look at in the book of Daniel, uh, what happens in the book of Daniel really is, man, the world will take our children, our best and brightest, and use them for their self. So go to That's Daniel right. chapter one. Now, as you look at the book of Daniel, one of the things historians will say that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were probably no older than 17. They probably could have been like 14 years old in the time of this scripture. So I see someone's getting a question to apostles. So before we jump into Daniel chapter one, we want to go ahead and get the question. And then I think we got some comments on Facebook. Go yes, right ahead. We got brother Victor in the audience here who wants to um, have a comment. We're getting the mic over to him now. So while we are doing that, the person on Facebook, you may want to go ahead and address that while we are preparing to hear from brother Victor. Yeah, you know, I think Chandler brings up a great point, Chandler. Chandler says this, we also have to get rid of, of this thing. What goes on in this house stays in this house. Create an environment where children can actually uh, share things that have gone on. So, you Brother know, Chandler, um, I love that. that. That's a really good point, Brother Chandler. Thanks for bringing that up. Now, I want to comment on that. There are things that go on in their home stays in their home. But I'm not, but things that are, we talk about abuse and uh, misconduct, uh, uh, you know, sexual activity and, and all the things that, those kinds of things need to be exposed. But the personal business of that family that's not detrimental to anybody still need to stay in the house. Good point, Apostle. Good point. Brother Victor. Uh, I have a sandwich. Um, as, as you was, were giving the 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 um, activities with uh, Absalom and his his brother, with his with his sister, uh, and in the end, um, Absalom took matters in his own hand. Now, I know that today we don't do that, but what's our approach today if we get caught in a situation like that? Uh, how, how do we handle that? Because we can't take matters in our own hand like Absalom did and had him killed. Now, see, the biggest thing, and that's a good question, Brother Victor, but the it biggest is. thing we have to look at is the age. If that child is under age, then there is a legal approach to it that can be done, brother or no brother. Um, there's there's um, legal things, you know, even, even when it says consent, it's still considered statutory. So um, uh, we have to, we can go as far as we can with that. But when people get older, our hands are kind of tied. We can expose it, we can call that out, but actually the actual doing something about it, we have to rely upon God to take care of those things for us. 
Yeah, I, I, <laughs> Brother Victor asked a really good question, and I'm, I'm just going to be honest. Uh, I, uh, Walter? I, I might have been asked. Walter? <laughs> I might have been asked a lot. I'm just going to be honest, man. It's you know, I didn't say decompress what I said. I'm with you. Walter. I'm with you, Dick Walter. <laughs> yeah, so Robert said it best. It's like, well, I want to pull this blade. And, 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 and let's just be honest about it. Let's be honest. Uh, it's only by the Holy Ghost that would stop some of us <laughs> from going over edge. Because when you hurt children, right. hurting children um, can hurt you. And so it's only, if someone came to me and said, you abuse one of my children, man, y'all pray for me. That's all I'm going to say. Y'all pray for decompressing because again, that's just something that's hard to watch. Yes. Something that's hard to experience. And again, I'm Holy Ghost field, uh, but my twin author ego, William may come out. So <laughs> <laughs> let's go to Daniel chapter one, Daniel chapter one. And as we look at this, as I said earlier, um, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, historians say they would have been between 14 and 17 years old, really young, that when they would have been uh, taken away from their homeland. But I want us to just watch Nebuchadnezzar's uh, thought process and what he did. Um, and so Daniel chapter one, beginning in verse one, in the third year of the, the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon and Jer Jer Jerusalem, and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of, of Shinar to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And he spake unto Athanaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king had appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names for, gave them uh, Daniel to his name, Belteshazzar, and Hananiah of Shadrach, and Mishael of Meshach, and Azariah of Abednego. And so the thing I want us to point out in this scripture, uh, when Nebuchadnezzar conquered a land, he took one, he took the treasure from um, whatever they had. He didn't only take their uh, physical treasure, financial treasure, he took the best and brightest, and he made them, his goal was to make them Chaldeans or Babylonians. He wanted to uh, indoctrinate them at such an early age that even when they potentially went back, they lost their identity. This is the important point. His goal was to change their identity. They were Israel, but his goal was to get them to see themselves right. as Babylonians. So he taught them the Babylonian tongue. He taught them the sciences, the arts, the finer things of Babylonian culture. So over time, now look at the scripture. It was a three-year indoctrination period where they were indoctrinated. They were fed. They were taken care of. They were taught these things of the Babylonians. So even though they became Israel, they were from Israel, he indoctrinated them. And one of the first things he did is he changed their name. So I want us to think about that. What, the, what does the enemy do today to our children? Uh, how does he indoctrinate and pour things into their mind to where, again, they might look like Israel, but they take on the identity of somebody else. Apostle, any thoughts or comments or any comments from the audience on that? You know, one of the things I think Sister Charmaine said earlier, um, when our children start being introduced to stuff, 
you know, and we got to take note of that because that enemy knows how to slow walk him. You, as you pointed out here, three years, you know, uh, Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, they were some of the brightest of Israel. They brought them in and indoct- tried to indoctrinate them. So just like they stood, as stories like this, we need to share with our children. You don't have to take on the, what other folks try to try to give you. Uh, you serve a God uh, that will bless you. And then when you you know keep on reading, you find that uh, how they how the eunuch was concerned what was going to happen to them. But guess what? God gonna protect you. God gonna take care of you. That's right. That's right. Hey, so again, this has been unbelievable conversation that we've had today. And as we dig into this lesson, this, and we've got got a part two on this lesson next week, but I believe Elder Taylor knew that we couldn't get to all of these scriptures, but I would encourage you um, to to look at the scriptures this week. And then one thing I want to share with the Sabbath school, and I would ask you to engage with me on this is as we think about how do we fight for our children today? And again, these are just some of the things I thought about. But if you're on Facebook, if you're on Zoom, I ask you to put it in the chat or come off mute after I review these. Um, How do we fight for our children today? And so several things, just four points I wanted to bring out. More is caught than taught. We must model godly behavior for our children and our grandchildren. They may never say anything. and, And I've shared this with you before. Uh, I watched my father do so many different things. Uh, he, he, he said he spoke to us, but a lot of things he did, I actually saw him do it. And, and I picked up some of those things. We must pray for our children daily um, if you're not doing that. And that would be an application I would encourage us this week to take. Let's pray for our children daily, not just our children, but children in the household of faith. Let's pray for them. Um, Helping our children to focus on who God wants them to become, especially with their character. Um, How do we help them with godly character? And finally, I would say this, speak life and good things over our children. Our words certainly have power. And so uh, all of us who have been parents or grandparents, there are times where our children can frustrate us. uh, But I think the amazing thing is let's be mindful of the things that we speak, that we say over our children. Because again, it could just be one negative comment, but that child holds on to that that negative comment their entire life. Mm -hmm. And again, they they just hold on to it. Well, my dad said this, or my mom or my grandma said this, and they hold on to it. So I think Sister Melinda in the sanctuary has her hand up. And so we want to get Sister Melinda, and then we'll take our comments from Facebook. God bless you, Sister Melinda. But you can have two children, and those two children are going to be different. You know, you can have one child that's going to make you they're going to come and tell you everything. And you just start praying for them immediately. And then there's going to be one that's going to be quiet. And you got to figure out what's going on. You know, my Tyrone is gone, but he was my learning experience from the time he was born. Tyrone would come home from school, and he would sit at the table four hours in the afternoon. And when the report card came in, He only passed physical education. (laughs) He had failures and everything else. Because he said, uh, Grandma Brooke, Grandma Bishop said, D will pass you. No, (laughs) not in my house. So I remember one day Tyrone would go to school. And, you know, I thought everything was going all right. And then one teacher was brave enough to call me. And she said, Miss Brooke, you got to come to school and check on Tyrone. He's sitting here all day long with the hoodie on his head. I said, what? So I went to the school, and they set me in a circle. And they put the teachers all around me and set Tyrone in the circle with me. I said, now, I don't have no business being here in a circle. But you see, when you're working all day and you don't pay attention to what's going on, something's going down, and you need to figure out what it is. And I hate to go back this far in my head, but... 
They set me in the circle, and then they was going around the circle telling me Tyrone keep his hoodie on, Tyrone don't say anything, Tyrone don't speak, he must not have any clothes to wear, you must be a single woman, you must not have a good home. Hold up, wait a minute. So I said, you know, I sat there, I said, Lord, I, you know, I got to pray on this first, because I know what I'm going to say. So I carried Tyrone out, I said, hold up everybody, wait a minute, let me take Tyrone out for a minute. So I went out the door, I whispered in his ear, and I said, if you don't get that hoodie off of you right now and straighten yourself up, it's going to be on when you get home. <laughs> so we went back in, we sat in the circle like I hadn't said a word. I thanked all the teachers for what they did and, you know, calling me in. And one woman was brave enough. I said, look, you all think I'm a single woman. You think Tyrone don't have any clothes on. He got on everything he got on match from his tennis shoes all the way up to his hoodie. I said, I'm married, I got a husband, we take care of him. I said, so now after the day, the expectation is that Tyrone would do what he's supposed to do. And you know after that day, Tyrone did so well till they invited us to a restaurant for dinner <laughs> because he passed everything. You know, sometimes you gotta listen to what people say to you and don't get defensive and say my child didn't do it. Because they will. Now, Jennifer was a different story. <laughs> when she did wrong, it was just wrong all together. <laughs> and she would say, yes, I did it. But I want to stand today to say, you know, we pray for our children, we That's put them right. on the altar. But whatever the Lord decides to do, we have to accept it. Because we right. told the Lord, take care of our child. And that's all I got to say. <laughs> Amen. I, I love what Sister Melinda said. And, and, and Sister Melinda, I, I love the point. Um, I, I wrote down two things um, that you said that really stood out to me. One was the expectation is. And you set that out and you spoke that. The expectation is. And then after that, um, he rose to the expectation. I think the other thing is, um, Sister Melinda brought a point is um, not being sensitive to other people giving you feedback about your child. Right. I think it is so important to say, hey, you know what? I see this child in my home, but they may be, you know, doing something else that you're not aware of. And when someone brings you that feedback, you can't say, well, that would never happen with my child. I hear people tell stories all the time of when they were growing up that if the neighbor saw them, that uh, the neighbor would get them. And then when they got home, they get it again. So the reality is we have to be mindful. Sister Charmaine says something. And then I'm, I, I see some comments on Facebook I want to read. She says, as parents, be real about our experiences. Yeah. And I think that's such a good point because our children, a lot of times are seeing us sometimes as a, not necessarily a finished product, but they, they see a better product. They didn't see the bumps and bruises and the hard times, the errors and the mistakes that we went through. There's nothing wrong with sharing that with our children to say, you know what? And I think the older I get and the older my children get is just saying, you know what? I didn't always have it together. I stubbed my toe a lot of times. I heard a saying recently, it said, smart people learn from their mistakes, but wise people learn from the mistakes of others. And so we're trying to help our children definitely learn from our mistakes. So Apostle, do you see the comment on Facebook that you want to read or you want me to read that? Go ahead and read them. It's, it's a couple in there, they're, you know, because they're, they're all are good comments. So, and I was going to say, I see why you and um, that first comment that uh, Minister West made, about tying the millstone around the neck and throwing the depths of sea. I see why y'all are such good friends. But go ahead on and read the rest of it. All right. So, uh, Sister Deborah Booz, thank you, Deborah, for engaging with us. She said, it's very important how we as parents and grandparents represent and present the father to our children. They need to know God loves them. Express to them that their sins can be forgiven if they repent. I felt for years after leaving home that it was too hard to be saved, that our God required too much based on what I've been taught. But to God be the glory for deliverance and real relationship with him, um, with, with you. Children must understand reverence for God. 
They must understand reverence for God and that God loves them and that um, if they repent, that they will be uh, they will be forgiven. And I think that's so important. And then she says, making sure they don't play with God, uh, but not be afraid of him. He loves us. He is our savior. Sister Deborah, thank you for that comment. I think that's it's kind of what Sister Charmaine was talking about at the very beginning. We want to make sure our children have a healthy respect and reverence for God. Uh, but we also want to make sure that they understand how much God loves them. I got another comment. Um, Sister Brother Rashawn says this, and I think this is a good comment. Join school board, yep. PTA, monitor the electronics. Don't say yes all the time. Be mindful of what they're exposed to on TV. Even Disney execs tout subtle introductions of the LGBT BT movement in their media. So, yes, uh, Brother Rashawn, appreciate those comments. Um, and again, I, as we wrap up, I want to catch Sister Frollo. She says it is sometimes assumed that we know how to raise children, <laughs> but the truth is we don't. I've made many mistakes in raising my daughter that lessons like this offered much earlier in my life may have resulted in different practices and produced different results. Um, nevertheless, I thank God for today's lesson and for the fact that no matter how much time has passed, with God's grace, we can begin today to do things differently. Thanks for this lesson. It's much needed and much appreciated. And so, Sister Furl, I'm like you. Some expo teaching I've been exposed to over the last three to five years I genuinely wish I had it earlier as a parent uh, because, again, um, my wife says it all the time. We never stop being parents, grandparents. You never stop being grandparents. And so we want to make sure we take lessons like this and apply them. Apostle, any other comments or questions before I turn it over to our sister Charmaine to wrap well, us up today? Yes, um, we have brother um, Adrian and the uh, Adrian Rolson and the audience want to have something. You too. And then brother Chandler uh, after that. But while, uh, while they're getting ready to that, uh, Deacon Preston, there is a um, comment uh, from Sister Renee Dixon. If you get a chance, you want to read that, but I think it's very good. Well, um, um, yeah. Good, good, Brother Keenan. Adrian. I mean, Adrian, I'm sorry. That's all right. And I knew who I, I, knew who I was talking to. I've been called worse. So. Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I always tell people that when they, it's, it's not a big deal. All right. Uh, two things I want to say, uh, like when I was growing up, a big issue was uh, low self-esteem. Yeah. So when children have low self-esteem, that's when they're targets for, you know, uh, predators and cult stuff, all that type yes. of stuff. And yes. suicide. So you got to watch out for that. And uh, the second point is the self-worth. If they don't know that they're worth something, they will always perform below what they can. Yeah, that is so true. If you would take it over to brother. Um, yeah. And I think being impressed that maybe we need to uh, pencil in next week. I have read the lesson, but um, suicide among uh, young people is something we need to, to tap on to see, to make sure that we are providing a healthy environment that whatever go on in their lives, that they feel comfortable. And that's what this comment, uh, as Sister Renee is saying, that they feel comfortable coming to us. Uh, go ahead, uh, Mrs. Chandler. Uh, I was just also going to say, as from someone that don't have physical kids, I do have nieces and nephews, I have godchildren. So um, we also have to be approachable even for other kids. Sometimes there, there's things that my sister and my brother has went through that they never told my mother, but they found that person that they was comfortable enough going to tell. Um, and so be that person, whether you are not just a parent, but whether you are a godparent, whether you are an uncle, I mean, uh, whether you are an uncle or an aunt, um, be that person, or even just a friend, that they are still comfortable enough going to, to tell, because you may never tell your parents everything, you know. So like I said, be in that place where you are approachable, that if someone does need help, or, or going through something that you are there for them. Yes. Yeah, um, brother, yeah, I love the comments. And so I heard Brother Adrian, I wrote this down, low self-esteem and making sure our children 
understand their self-worth. So I think great nuggets that, that you shared right, right there. And then Brother Chandler, you talked about being approachable, even if you're not a parent, being an approachable and creating an environment where children feel comfortable to come to you. And I think when I look at um, Renee Dixon's comments, and Renee, thanks for engaging with us. She says, one of the things that my students always tell me is they can't talk to their parents. We must be approachable. And that's what Brother Chandler said, approachable parents no matter what our children tell us. And Apostle Ragler said earlier, don't act shocked when they share it. <laughs> don't act shocked when they share it. Sometimes our children are going to tell us things that we may not want to hear, but we need them to know that they can talk to us about anything that they are going through. It's it only the strength of God that will help us to listen and not react in a negative manner. So Sister Dixon, thank you for that comment and the other comments from our audience at the church and everyone, just great comments and thoughts. And let's take these and apply them. So Apostle, any other comments, thoughts we need to capture before we put it into the hands of Sister Charmaine? I will say this quickly because I know at times getting away from us. Parents, uh, when you have more than one child, children perform at different levels. Children, uh, academic um, abilities may differ from one child to the other, but we got to be very, very careful that the child who is the um, who doesn't perform as well in in the academics that we don't make them feel badly. You know, we embrace them and and, and make sure that they feel equal uh, with our love. And if if they do and they're doing their very best, that we embrace them and we push them. And, 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 and just support them because sometimes the parents don't feel that way, but the children got it in their mind. I'm not as smart as my brother. So um, since I'm not as smart as my, my brother, um, they don't see me the same way. Um, and yet with the one that is the shining star, we don't want to hold them back either. So that's one of the things that's not written in the handbook on parenting. How do we handle those situations? But we got to come to understand what to do and how to do it so both of those children grow up to be productive individuals. Amen. Again, thank you so much for your engagement. Sister Charmaine, I'm going to put it in your hands. And uh, we've got part two next week. So join us next week, and we will hopefully be as engaged in that part two as you were in this part one. God bless you. Amen. We do thank the Lord for the Sabbath school lesson. Um, as I said earlier, another beautiful lesson. We thank God for your participation. And I, I do want to say this. Apostle uh, kind of drove this this statement home. And it I, I thank God for it because it certainly has served well in dealing with parenting. And that is that unconditional love for your children. Sometimes they will disappoint us. Sometimes they will not do it the way they've been taught. Right. Um, but that doesn't stop us from loving them. Right. Um, and and the Lord teaches you have to ask. You got we got to ask God to to help us with that. Teach That's us how to love so unconditionally, because He certainly is the example of what it looks like to love unconditionally. Whether you get it right or wrong, I love you unconditionally. <clears throat> So we're going to turn the service into the hands of our pastor. Again, thank you so much for tuning in, and may the blessings of the Lord be upon you. Amen. Let me just say real quickly, dealing with children, they make you want to go upside the head. Amen. But you got to remember, they're yours. They are, they are God's inheritance that he has given to you. Amen. And we just asked him, and they didn't come with a, a, a handbook. You know, you buy a new car, look in the glove box, that's an owner, owner's manual. You didn't get that with that child. So most of this you have to learn over a course of time. But ask God to instruct you that you may instruct them. Uh, and and be, just be, the, be that loving parent. When they, even when they disappoint you, let them know they disappointed you. But let them know that you still love them. So with that being said, we're going to... Um, Table this, if you would, until next Sabbath. Thank all, all of you for engaging. Come back with us at 1 o'clock and join us in the afternoon worship experience. Amen. May the Lord watch between me and thee while we are absent one from another. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, saints.